What is a crazy story about prison life you can share that is totally true? I have three. Never personally been myself. I had a good friend, was his best man at his wedding, he seemed headed for great things but spiraled out. Long story of how he got there and convoluted, but he made some people in the legal system angry so ended up with a long sentence in county lockups. He had some interesting stories. One he told is, there was no smoking allowed, but people still managed to do so. People would smuggle in tobacco and a few puffs were very highly valued and sought after. He said they used the pages from a Bible to roll a tiny cigarette but lighting them was challenging. He said people would steal paper clips from files and legal papers and keep them as they had many different uses. But to light a cigarette, you get a look out and someone jams the paperclip into an electrical outlet, and then the other end in, if done right the breaker does not pop and the paperclip turns red enough to lit the cigarette. If someone gets zapped in the process it's a small price to pay. People will go to extraordinary lengths to have a smoke. I was repeating this story and a retired Le guy was sitting there, decorated detective and long career. He was an expert interrogator and investigator. He ranted about this and explained the liberals made the police station and jails non-smoking and even during an interrogation it was prohibited. He said it was often very helpful to get a suspect slash witness talking by soothing them, making them comfortable or if they were having a nick fit, nicotine withdrawal, a cigarette given to them by the detective as a very powerful motivator. He would often break the non-smoking policy and tell anyone who had an issue to go f themselves. If you are closing a case on a serious crime or homicide, you do whatever you can to get a cooperative witness or suspect. To hell with non-smoking. Another story was he was hanging out with a guy a lot of us knew. This was a famous nightclub in Portland, Oregon. They were running a ticket scam and pocketing the proceeds. We all knew something was not kosher as some events had the place so packed it was well beyond capacity. Sometimes the tickets were sold out so we were told to go around the corner to Larry's girlfriend's bar and some tickets had been released. Any rate, I don't know if the real story ever got out, but one of the guys involved was murdered by the club's owner Larry Hurwitz and a stagehand. The story had a lot of twists and turns and you can read about it elsewhere but here's a short version. C. Tim Moreau would have been 50 this month, had he not been the victim of one of Portland's most remarkable crime stories. So my buddy hung out with Larry during his trial. He said Larry was one worried guy being into music they had a lot to talk about and Larry was a very interesting guy and running the club knew everything and everyone in the music business. However one thing was. They never could find that poor guy's body. At one point a deal was offered if they would lead police to the remains for the benefit of the family. Multiple trips up the Columbia River Gorge but for nothing. Larry confided they would never find the body because it had been chopped up into little pieces and dumped into many rivers and off bridges. There was nothing left to find. So it was shocking this was someone I knew, many us knew him and now. He is out of prison and still in the area and still working in the music business. Next time you go to a show or event. You might just have run into a brutal murderer. Last one, I worked at an aerospace manufacturer for a while. With my background and tech training I was surprised it was so hard to get a job there. When I did get a job there I was rather shocked at some of the employees. It turns out this company gets sizable tax deals and other incentives to hire people straight out of prison or other challenges. That's a good thing usually. But it was an eye-opener that a highly skilled aerospace technician had a hard time getting a job at an aerospace manufacturer but others got right in. So we had one guy who walked around with two different tennis shoes every day. Most people think it's just weird but it's actually a coded FU. He explained trustees in prison wore one type of tennis shoes and regular convicts wore another. In prison speak, wearing two kinds of shoes sends a powerful message. In another, one of our best welders had spent a lot of time in California prisons. And told a story of one guy who killed a lot of people, how he got caught was he had a pool construction business and hid the bodies under the swimming pools. But, as the bodies decayed the pools would eventually crack or fail. The first few he got back in and repaired without anyone learning. Why? But, eventually someone called a different contractor. Busted. He then launched into another story of a guy who came home and found his wife having sex with another man. In a fit of anger and passion, the man shot them, the bullets killed the man but only wounded the wife. The guy explained the convict's lifelong regret was. The bitch didn't die. One of our other co-workers was separated from her husband and this guy was a biker and had made threats. But, she was dating a few different guys in our department and when this story was repeated I looked over at her. Her eyes were bulged out and she looked rather freaked out. When I first got to DVI, a California prison, many 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 moons ago, I was standing in chow line one day waiting to get to the serving window and the guy behind me tapped me on the shoulder and politely said excuse me. Then reached around me and shoved a shank into the back of the guy in front of me. Who immediately collapsed. Then the guy behind me told me, well? You gonna stand there and gawk, or ain't you hungry? I had no idea what to do, knowing well enough the unwritten rules of not getting involved. So stepped over him and acted like nothing happened. It might seem inhumane and callous. 
but so is getting your throat slit from behind for sticking your nose in others' business in prison, especially after they so recently demonstrated their inclination to deal with things in less than diplomatic fashion. I never found out the details of it. It took the Chow Hall guard several minutes to notice the man down. And we went straight into lockdown without ever getting that meal. It was most certainly either a hit or pre-planned attack. I never saw either guy again, but heard the one guy survived and the other one never got caught. So it goes in prison. A fun place to visit. Ask your travel agent about the discount hotel rates. My son got certified as an adult at 16, in a state case, and was in federal prison, on a new case, by 18. He was not in his right mind and was looking to have psycho and god knows what else tattooed on his face. I had the very good fortune to meet, at my son's request, a man with a nickname Joker. Who was locked up with my son in the county jail at the very beginning. I did some small legal work for Joker, only because my son said the guy was his friend. Neither my son nor I expected to maintain contact with Joker. That same guy, by our pure luck, ended up housed with my son at a federal prison in a faraway place. Joker somehow. I didn't know by what authority, but others feared him or respected him. Issued a mandate in their unit that no one could tattoo my son on his forearms, hands, neck, face, or head. Even though my son was actively looking for that. My son is 37 years old now, and has been off paper for 13 years. Joker died of a heroin overdose some years ago. I think of Joker almost every day, and am eternally thankful to him. So is my son. Every single door would have closed to my son, forever, if it wasn't for Joker. My friend collected a debt from a guy and the guy told his Hell's Angels prison dad. They ordered my friend to yard too. Presumably get disciplined for this supposed infraction. I tagged along with an 8-inch metal spike made from an oven rack. Three men awaited me, my friend and his friend who was also ordered to the yard because he initiated the debt collection. We met in the washroom and the leader of the biker clowns said to me, What the fuck you doing here? I responded saying, I'm here to support my friend. He ordered me from the washroom and I stood there. My friend said, It's okay wait, outside. I left it and the fight began. Two of the men attacked my friend and the fat biker began fighting the other guy then threw him out of the washroom door like a western movie, so they could three on one my friend who was large, young, and tough. So, when the guy got up of the ground I handed him my knife, and said get in there and do something I'll keep the door safe. He took the shank then right at the door dropped it and began again trying to fist fight this fat biker. Now about 100 inmates saw me pass the knife so I knew my ticket just got punched so I said. F it. I ran over grabbed the knife and as soon as I picked it up someone yelled 6 up. Meaning the guards were now responding late as always the lazy pigs didn't even stay in the prison yard instead hid in a checkpoint. Anyway one of the attackers ran out of the washroom. The fat leader biker then the second guy stopped right in front of me to peek out the door for pigs. Dot right then and I smashed his face with 220 pounds of muscle bended, and he dropped. I caught a glimpse of the guy who started it all run by me and spun to give chase. A second later, I plunged the spike into his back and pulled it out to a collective gasp of the entire prison yard. I turned and now the guards were screaming drop the knife. I walked into the washroom and bent it and threw it into the toilet so they could suffer the indignity of retrieving it. As I walked out the guy I punched was staggering to his feet. I snap kicked him right in the balls and he dropped again. The guards tried to handcuff me and I refused. I said. I'm walking out of here. They were too scared to argue and I walked to segregation. I found out that night I had punched the spike into his back through the lung and out the chest. Unfortunately he lived. I got a promise to appear in court and my release was only 30 days away. I got out and murdered a man two months later. I eventually plead guilty to manslaughter and bank robbery and got 18 years. I served 11 and got parole. And the charge for stabbing the a-hole never made it to court it was stated as self-defense. I never heard from either my friend or his friend ever again. And now when someone asks me, can you back me up? I think twice. Thank you for joining us. Make sure to subscribe and click the like button. When the stories run out. Make sure to flip the tape over to continue. Adios amigos.